you you may be kind enough to yourself to know that um you know well there are only two options uh, that remain uh, if god gives us life we can try again tomorrow and if he does not then there is nothing to worry about it would be the end of the story um so uh, look forward to tomorrow to trying again to doing uh, better to improving um, whatever you perhaps had uh, set to do but didn't do so well um, and if God gives us life then take it for another day and see how best one can improve um, in meeting whatever obligations that they have um, in life okay and of course, if we don't wake up tomorrow, as Solomon says it, we no longer have any cares for the world of the living. And so what we didn't do well today, uh, as Paul would say, whether we live or die, it is to the glory of God. Um, so that would be just the end of it. Um, but otherwise, um, if we are showing up tomorrow again and the day after and the day after that, then all we can do is wake up every day with the intention to do the best uh, that we can and to actually uh, fulfill that intention um, as much as we possibly can. So we are in um, the second day of our looking into love relationships. And we are really still at the foundational phase of their establishment. Now, one of the things that God does for us in the Bible is he sets out for us a very good foundation to assist us uh, or help us understand um, uh, perhaps the, the basis or the motivation um, for, for uh, starting relationships. Yes, the motivation for uh, starting relationships. And I want to trace their establishment. And I think it's such an important thing uh, to, 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 to look at because often, again, I'll come from the perspective of pastoral uh, counseling. Often um, you, you, you get couples coming um, saying they either want to get married or they are in a relationship with each other. And sometimes it's not really in a counseling session, it's just in a social discussion, uh, you know, with people in church or wherever. And you sometimes get a sense as you are listening to couples talking that um, what is putting them together is not what is, is uh, recommended by the Bible. And that may sort of make one worry because um, you, you, you start to think of the challenges that may come um, in the lifespan of the relationship, which will cause you to question why are you together? And if the answer is not very clear, then that is where uh, many relationships will then not survive a day longer. They are going to come to an end. So all of us must know that um, whether you are married and those who are married may share uh, their experiences uh, in, uh, you know, and understand what we are talking about. So whether you are married or um, you, you perhaps have been in a, a, a love relationship now for quite some time, we will all agree that there are different types of challenges that a relationship will face. But you get those uh, uh, challenges or problems which seem to spe be specifically targeting the question, why are you together? And the answer uh, 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 to that question is really what gets you to overcome those problems. You know, some problems challenge your personality some problems challenge your future, okay? So the answer needs to come from the future. Some problems in a relationship or a marriage, they ask, what is your future plan? That is what the problem is trying to say. 
are you prepared for tomorrow? Um, and so you can only answer that problem by bringing your answer from the future and saying, yes, we are prepared for tomorrow. Uh, some problems in a relationship challenge you, your personality, your character. So they are asking you, who are you? And so the answer is to come from within and say, this is who I am. And some challenges in relationships challenge your past. Where are you coming from? Are you aware of where you are coming from and how it has impacted you? Some problems in a relationship are going to ask, why are you together? So in all these problems, we must have appropriate answers. We must find the answers in the right places. So, and today we're going to look at that foundational one. Because if people don't know why they are together, then when life challenges the relationship with such questions, regrettably, the inability to then answer why you are together automatically means you shouldn't be together. And then what either happens is that people accept they don't know why they are together, but because they are bored and they don't want to be alone, they'll just continue anyway. Or then the relationship um, may, may find uh, itself coming to an end, all right? So in Genesis chapter two, God lays out a number of uh, scenarios that give us an understanding that what is the foundation and the basis of relationships um, where God is, is concerned. And I'm going to start with looking at verses that start with what it should not be and then move into what they establish uh, relationships to be, okay? Now, when you look at um, verse 18 and 19, which is where we are going to start in Genesis chapter two, uh, verse 18 and 19, it says, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. And that's where I'm going to start from. So Adam has been created. Now I've dealt with you here in this series with Genesis chapter one, and we've already clarified that in Genesis chapter one, verse 27 and 28, God says, and he made them male and female in his image. So we know now beyond any reasonable doubt that from the beginning, the intention of God was to create the male and the female. So in chapter two, when he creates the male first and the female after, it's not because the male is superior, the female is inferior, or because the female is an afterthought, or because the male is the image of God and the female is not, no. By creating them at separate times, he is now exactly teaching us this message he wants us to know about what is the foundation and the establishment of relationships. By creating them at separate times, he is teaching them and all their descendants what is the divine purpose of a relationship and the pattern that it must follow. So, the first we see there in verse 18. And the Bible says, then the, uh, 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 and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. Th that, that is important. Because what we get there is that the first person, or maybe not the first person, person may not be the right word, but the first one to declare the necessity of relationships is God. Remember in Genesis 1 verse 26 and 27, he told us that we, there will be a male and a female, but he didn't tell us what would be our relationship between this male and female. So if we were to go by Genesis 1 verse 27 and 28, that's all we know. There'll be a male, there'll be a female. 
We didn't know whether they'd live in the same garden, what relationship they would have. So in chapter two, he defines the relationship. Remember, I've, I've taught this before in this group, that Genesis one defines creation. Genesis two defines the relationships between created things and each other and the created things and their creator. So in Genesis one, we learn what is it. In Genesis two, we learn how should it live, okay? And that's very important. Always remember that, okay? What is it? Chapter one, it is the image of God. It has two parts male and female. In Genesis chapter two, how shall it live? This is now where we are, where God is defining the how of the what that he made in chapter one. Now, when he gives us the how, he speaks. It makes sense that he speaks. He's the creator. The creature does not know its own how it will know its how from its maker, all right? You, you can't, you know, whatever it is, the first cell phone, the first television, the first whatever that was ever made. It, you know, a cell phone wasn't made and then after it was made, no one knew what it must do. And then the cell phone suggested, Maybe I should make calls, send SMSs, you know, receive emails, store music. No, no, no. The creation does not determine its own process of life. The creator must inform it. The creator must program it. The creator must tell it, what have I made you to do or to accomplish? And so God does it. God says, it is not good for a man to be alone, okay? So now he is showing us why in chapter one, he made two of them. He is telling us now, what is the necessity of the functioning of these two? It is not good for a man to be alone. And this also is important here because what now God is clearly defining, and I'm going to now uh, get a bit technical on this one. Remember that the word Adam, 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 the Hebrew word Adam, it doesn't mean male. It means human. Always be very careful of that because this is where patriarchal problems uh, start from. It is the failure to see the words in their fullest meaning. So today, for example, um, we name boys Adam, but we don't name um, women Adam, which is a problem because Adam is not a male. Adam is human. That is what it means properly translated Adamai, meaning a creature formed from the earth, okay? So this is a human. Adam is not a male. Adam is a definition of the creature and how the creature is formed, all right? And for that reason, it's important to understand that Adam describes men and women, it's the human, it's the human creature, okay? It's the creature formed from the soil. Remember, the fact that Eve is, from, is formed from the rib does not divorce her from the soil. The rib is from the soil. She and him have their creation in the soil. And the soil is then 
by the power of God, transformed into something else. First, it is transformed into a, a, a human male creature. And from the human male creature, a, a bone, a rib is transformed into a female creature. So these are the growing stages of the soil creature. Okay, and throughout the Bible, by the way, very important Hebrew studies, throughout the entire Bible, when the Bible in Hebrew speaks of human beings, it, use, it uses variations, Adam, Adamai, those are the variations in order to show that Adam is the human, okay? Then the humans are then defined differently, okay? Where, for example, then if it is a, a son, it is a bin, bin, okay? If it is a girl or a daughter, it is a beth, okay? So, but the anchoring is that they are the Adam, they are the human, they are the creature formed from the ground. So Adam is not an entitlement of males only. Adam is the entitlement of the image as represented first in, in, in Genesis 1 verse 26 and 27. Now then God says, it is not good for the man, for the Adam to be alone. It is not good for the human to be alone. Now, why is God now trusting us? Remember that the first creature, the, uh, the first Adam that we have, he doesn't know anything about being anything other than himself. He has never seen a female before. He has never seen other males before. So there are two things the first Adam doesn't have. One, he does not miss friends because no one has ever told him there will be many of him. Number two, he is not lonely for a wife because no one has told him a female or different version of him might exist. That information is only known by the creator. So as far as the Adam is concerned, being alone is natural. This is how things are ought to be. He has no, remember the human has never existed before. So he has no inclination of desiring what is not there. He is the first of his kind, so he can't miss women. The concept of a woman doesn't exist. He can't miss friends. The concept of relationships doesn't exist. As far as he knows, the world is perfect when it is God, him, and all of nature. He doesn't know anything different. And then God says, now it's time to introduce another Adam into this picture, okay? And the following Adam is then the one who will be called uh, Eve, all right? And again, even then, um, the, 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 the actual name that uh, is given to her is a woman, meaning, uh, made from the man, okay? And so even then, you can see by basic linguistics that they are again sharing the same common root. The common root is that they are both men, all right? They are both men. They are both human beings, in other words. And then the woman, and then there is the Adam, who we are now going uh, what, 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 what do they call it? Um, when language develops colloquially, we are now going to use the word Adam as if the 
one person who captures that very well in the Bible is Luke. When Luke tells us the genealogy of Jesus, he gets to the top and he says, who was the son of Adam, who was the son of God. And the reason why Luke says son of Adam is because he wants to make sure that it is understood that Christ is for all humanity because Adam is all humanity. Adam is the ancestor of all humanity, males and females. So in Adam, Christ is the human and the human for all humans, the males and the females. He is not the savior of the males because if Jesus is only the son of Adam, then he is only the savior of the men and the women must wait for a savior who is an Eve. The reason the Bible only speaks of Jesus as the son of the Adam, it is because the Adam is the human. So all humans, males and females, are represented in him in finding a savior. All right? It's a very important and very broad concept, uh, The what the Greeks would later call the anthropos, the Adam, the human species. And when we miss its humanity and jump in, into its gender without understanding its humanity, that is where abuse begins. Many, many people understand gender, but have no clue what is humanity. So we've built relationships on gender with a very faulty and often non-existent theory of humanity. You need to go to Genesis and first sort the theology of humanity before you master gender. Because when you are working on gender and you are clueless about humanity, the application goes out the door, faulty all the way. The theories you develop about what a man is, what a woman is, what a woman should and shouldn't do, what a man should and shouldn't do, it's already lost because you are starting from the application of the Adam. Being male and female are applications of the Adam. The Adam is the human. And the human is applied in two versions, the male and the female. Most of us are jumping to apply what we don't understand in its creation. Then the marriages are faulty. The parenting is faulty. The friendships are faulty. The racism that comes out of it, the patriarchy that comes out of it, the, the I am better than you because I've got longer hair comes out. I am better than you because I've got a six pack comes out. It, it, it's a ripple effect of what was missed in the Adam. When God sets the relationship, he speaks. He says, it's not good for humanity, for human beings to be alone. In their male and in their female form, they shouldn't be alone. They shouldn't be alone. So he says, I will create a helper suitable um, for him. So now he thrusts them into the relationship. Very important then to understand that our obsession with being in relationships should in some ways be very carefully subjected to the question, is it God who desires it for you and me? Or are we the ones desiring it for ourselves outside of understanding what his intentions about relationships are. Because here, it is God who designs the relationships for human beings. It's not Adam that approaches God and says, may I please have a wife? May I please have another human being? It's God who desires it. 
Now, two things begin to emerge here. That Adam, and now I'm using the word Adam as we would colloquially use it to mean this specific man that is in the garden. Adam has no sense of loneliness or emptiness because there are no other human beings. Why is that? It's because Adam is complete and perfect, alone, but complete and perfect. Alone, but complete and perfect. In other words, when God designed the relationships, a relationship's intention is not to end loneliness or to complete you. In the book of Genesis, relationships are given by God to people who are already complete from his manufacturing, they are complete. And then he puts them together for a purpose. Loneliness and emptiness is not one of them. And the crisis we have in the world today is relationships are used as a plug for a leak of emptiness. You know, in our bathtubs or in our sinks, in our uh, 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 kitchens, we've got that stopper so that when we are washing the dishes, the water does not drain out. Or when we are bathing, the water does not drain out. The problem with many of us is that we are leaking. We are leaking in character. And we think by getting married, we will put a stopper. In other words, we will save a faulty character. Many of us want to heal our character faults by bringing someone in our lives as a stopper. I am lonely. I am empty. So what do I do? I want a relationship. We are dealing with a leak in character, but we are misapplying the cure. We are bringing a relationship as a solution to a character fault. When God gives us relationships in Genesis, it was not to address a faulty atom, a leaking atom, an empty atom, a bored atom. In fact, when you look at um, verse 19, out of the ground, the Lord formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. Do you notice what is happening here in verse 19? Adam is preoccupied with the productive things. Adam is not sitting in the garden, twiddling his thumbs, thinking, oh, I'm so bored. If only there was someone I could date. No, no. Did you notice that Eve arrived in a life that was already filled with God's purpose? Adam is already busy. He's already managing the garden. He's already naming animals. God is creating and sending. That is what it says. God has created, and now God is introducing Adam to all created things. And God is saying to Adam, I didn't give it names. It, 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 I decided to leave that as a gift to you. Give it names. So it is a symbol of a productive, fulfilling life. Adam is not lonely. Adam is not empty. Adam is not bored. Adam is very much happy, healthy, complete, perfect, and occupied with meaningful activities. Marriage has a bad reputation today because we got married to fix a character fault, not to follow God's plan. Now everyone out there has a very negative view of marriage because God has been ignored by those who get married. 
instead of solving our character leaks, we have thought bringing someone in as some kind of a pacifier or, or a panado or a paracetamol, instead of addressing your issues, you think getting married is a way out. And we'll look into those issues that people use as a basis for getting into relationships. Now, also the next part of chapter 19 says, and whatever, call, whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. All right. Now listen to verse 20. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. Please pay attention to that. And I'm going to ask that we, we go through this very carefully. One notice. This is not Adam's speech. This is a record. In other words, the recorder is acknowledging Adam was alone, not that Adam complained. As far as Adam was concerned, nothing was lacking in his world. Nothing. Everything was perfect. So the fact that the recorder says Adam was alone does not mean Adam was distressed by being alone. He was alone. He was not lonely. He was alone. He was not lonely. He was alone, busy, productive, healthy, happy, well-created, alone. He was not lonely, distressed, worried about the calendar, running out of time, worried whether he will ever get to have children, worried whether uh, will any woman still want to marry him, worried whether he will uh, produce grandchildren before his parents die, which are the fallacies of this world. People have gotten married to procreate. People have gotten married to, 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 to have a financial support. People have gotten married to fill a gap of loneliness. All reasons not stipulated in God's original plan, which is why marriage is messed up. Because people for cultural reasons, for religious reasons have gotten married and none of those reasons are aligned to God's intention for why he started marriage in the first place. When are you getting married? You are getting old, uh, the parents will say. When are you getting married? When am I having grandchildren? It may be your culture's desire then you should have children. But nowhere in Genesis was having children the reason for the marriage. On the contrary, the children are the outcome of the marriage, not the reason for the marriage. In Genesis, the outcome of their relationship is that they will be fruitful and multiply. Not that they must be in a relationship so that they become fruitful and multiply. God could have made them uh, uh, to be fruitful and multiply without getting married. He didn't need marriage. We've already, we know it, we know, we know it. There are creatures in this world um, uh, uh, what is the biological term? Um, uh, 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 hema hemaphrodite. We, in the sea, for those of you who follow biology and science, in the sea, there are creatures that self-reproduce, creatures that have male and female sex organs. They don't procreate with other creatures. They produce both seeds within themselves. God did not need a male and a female to be together 
for fruitful and multiply. He could have put a womb in a man and a womb in a woman, and in both the man and the woman, he could have put a, a, the seed of the sperm and the seed of the ovary. Today, it would be natural that even a man reproduces internally and a woman reproduces internally. God has already demonstrated it in the nature that we see that the, 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 the existence of a male and a female is not necessary for reproduction. Many creatures are doing it without having another partner. But our cultures have reduced marriage into reproduction. Not even our cultures, our own personal desires. We want to be parents so badly. Yeah? I'm growing old. The calendar is passing. I have no children. But that is not the purpose. That is not the purpose. Let me come to something that always confuses people, and I don't understand why. Listen to God. Please listen. At the end of verse uh, 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 20. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable for him. All right, Adam doesn't have a helper. Helper for what? I've, I've heard people tripping over this word, helper, helper, helper. Uh, she was there to help him. Helper for what? But we know for what. Because in verse 19, he has been given a duty to take care of the garden. And we know what that means because in Genesis 1, verse uh, uh, 20, 27 and 28, you hear it again. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So we know what she is a helper for. She is a helper for dominion. She is a helper to be fruitful. She is a helper for multiplication. She is a helper for taking care of the birds of the sea and the creeping things and the bird, uh, uh, I mean, the, the animals in the sea and the birds in the air. We know the mandate why she is a helper. We know that mandate. It's not new. The mandate is written in black and white. Then suddenly people act like they don't know what is Eve's duty. Eve's duty is not to wash dishes. That is your culture's view. Eve's duty, we know it. It's not something that requires rocket science. It's written in black and white. She is his helper for dominion. In other words, she dominates with him. She stewards with him. She runs the garden with him. That's the mandate here. The mandate is written in black and white. And all of a sudden, everyone is confused about what are the duties of a woman. Cultures are confused, not God. Just because the Zulus and the Shonas and the English and the French are struggling with what to do about women, don't impose that on God. God from the beginning knew very well what he wants the male and the female to do. He explained their mandate. He explained their mandate. So if in your culture, women must only wash dishes and must never lead, that's your culture's position. The biblical position is she's here to have dominion with him. Now, that means biblically, I'm not talking culturally, biblically, we discuss how we will exercise dominion. And we distribute duties based on the mandate of dominion, not based on the, the mandate of what it means 
to be a woman in the Shona culture, what it means to be a woman in the Zulu culture. That's not the biblical mandate. The biblical mandate doesn't say women must stay at home and raise children. That's not here. Where do we get that? That's not in the Bible. The Bible says she is his helper. We know the duty. The duty has been explained. Have dominion. So we know biblically what is the first duty of Adam and Eve? They must both have dominion. Secondly, we know that it's not only the duty of Eve. Remember, this was announced to be both of them. Be fruitful and multiply. What does that mean? It is Adam and Eve's duty to raise children. God didn't say, as for you, Eve, thou shall be fruitful and multiply. He speaks to both of them. Be fruitful and multiply. Which means the one who can get pregnant must get pregnant. Who gets pregnant? Eve. All right? Then the question is, after giving birth, is it only Eve who can birth a child? Is it only Eve who can feed a child? Is it only Eve who can change an nappy? No. The task is given to both of them. Both must be fruitful and multiply. So the question is, can Adam raise a child? The answer is yes. Now why is Adam not doing it? Who came up with this idea that it is Eve's duty to do it? It's not the scriptures, it's culture. Now our churches are busy fighting over culture. People have converted their cultures into a biblical position. It's not a biblical position. The biblical position is if you are his helper, we know what that means. Because in verse 19, we saw his duties. We also saw in verse 27 and 28 of chapter 1, the duties being explained by God in detail. And at the time when he was explaining them, he was not only explaining them to Adam. Why am I saying that? Because verse 28 tells us he made them in his image, male and female, verse 27. So look at this. In verse 27, he tells us who he is talking to. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So who is God addressing the male and the female? What is he saying to the male and the female? Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, who said Adam must dominate alone? That's not in the mandate of chapter 2 of verse 28. God addressed both of them. Who said Eve must raise children alone? Because when I read, unless my Bible was printed wrongly and you have the original version, but I don't see where God is speaking to Eve alone saying, as for you, Eve, be fruitful and multiply. As for you, Adam, have dominion. As for you, Eve, a, a, a stay home and raise children. As for you, Adam, go out there and become a CEO of a company. I don't get. I don't get how our spirituality has been infiltrated by, by culture so much that we are now defending culture as if we are defending the word of God. Somewhere along the line, we managed to take the oppressive idea of sin over gender and made it a biblical position. And now we are stuck with it. We are stuck with it as if God uttered it. God didn't utter it. And we'll see as, as, as we are going, okay? So we know now that relationships have a purpose. It's not to help you because you are lonely. It's not because you, you want to have children. 
That is an outcome of it. We know now that the purpose here is a very big mission. The purpose here is dominion. The purpose here is stewardship. And because of this dominion and stewardship, God brings a couple and, and puts them in the garden and says, this is what I want you to do. So if you are lonely, don't get into a relationship. You need Jesus. If you are lonely, you need Jesus. You don't need a girlfriend. You don't need a boyfriend. You don't need a wife. You don't need a husband. You need Jesus. You are leaking in character. And only Jesus fixes character. Okay? This is why lonely people will stress you. This is why lonely people will exhaust you in a relationship. Because lonely people will expect you to be their Jesus. They will suck everything out of you because what they really need is a savior and you are not a savior. Many people are now married and they are stuck. They are stuck. They are being drunken every day. They are being milked every day. And they have nothing more to give because you married a lonely person. Instead of looking for their God, they looked for you. And because at the time you thought it was romantic to be needed, you also rushed into it because you loved the way they were needing you. Ah, now they are needing you nonstop and you are now feeling it. You are unable to keep up with the demands of being needed because you confused yourself for a savior. Lonely people must go to Jesus. Relationships are for people who want to fulfill a purpose on earth. That's a different issue. That's the biblical issue. When you believe time has come to fulfill your purpose in this world, then you need a life partner. Then you need a lover. It is time to get a companion with whom you will fulfill God's mandate for your life. When you are lonely, go to your baptismal class. God is speaking to you. If you are lonely, please, you are misunderstanding. God is not saying find a lover. You are being called to repentance. Loneliness is an issue of character. Go to Jesus. Don't find a partner. Go to Jesus. That is where character is solved. Relationships is where purpose is given an environment to be fulfilled. And many of us do not understand this. It all then flows from that purpose. Okay, let's continue. So, then the Bible says, and the Lord God caused the man, uh, Adam, to fall into a deep sleep, and he took one of the ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, uh, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam then said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Now it brings us to the next process. When God now makes Eve the woman, what does God do? He makes the man to sleep. Why? So that 
the man has no say in how the woman looks. I bet you did not just hear me. When the woman was made, the man was asleep. The only one with authority on the looks of a woman is God. The only one who was awake when the woman was made. The man cannot have authority on the looks of the woman. He was asleep when she was made. He had no suggestions. He had no input. What Adam received, he praised God for. Please listen very carefully. When Eve came, Adam did not make any editing. Adam did not say to God, Lord, I think these breasts are too small. Lord, I think this bum uh, is too big. Lord, I'm worried about this height. Adam had no clue what a woman should look like. So the one he got from the Lord is the one he was grateful for. Let me repeat that. The woman that he received from the Lord is the one he was grateful for. That is why Jesus says, if you look at a woman lustfully, you've sinned. Why? Because you have been granted no authority on the appearance of a woman. A man has only two options. Be grateful for the wife you were given. Stay away from having opinions about women you were not given. A woman is a gift from God. You do not edit the gift. The maker will deal with the gift. That is why we don't beat women, because we were not authorized to edit. We were only given a gift. When you are beating up a woman, you are taking the position of God. You are becoming a panel beater to a creation when we were not authorized to edit the creation. Show me in scripture. Show me in scripture where Adam had a view about how Eve looks. He had nothing to say except to praise God. All he did was praise God for the woman he got. Are you with me? Go, go, go beyond. I'm, I'm proving it. In Genesis chapter 3, when the woman had sinned and had eaten the fruit, did God authorize Adam to beat her? Did God authorize Adam to correct her? He did not. He came, corrected her himself, corrected him himself, corrected the snake himself. Why? Never did God authorize them to correct each other. He corrected them because all are accountable to him. They have not been authorized to correct each other. They have been authorized to come to him when something needs to be corrected. Show me in the Bible where God says to Adam, because the woman has sinned, I authorize you to now deal with her sin. He didn't. He dealt with her. He did. He's her maker. Adam was asleep. He will deal with her. He made Adam before the woman existed. He did not authorize her to correct him. He corrected Adam because she was not there when he made Adam. When he made the snake, Adam and Eve were not yet created. They were created on the sixth day. 
when he was correcting the snake, he did not hand the snake to them to say, decide what you want to do. He corrected the snake because all of them were made by him without each other's uh, contribution. Okay? Now, you need to understand that. Then God says to the man, the earth is cursed because of you. You will work very hard. He says to the woman, your desire will be after your husband and you will give birth uh, 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 in pain. It's not Adam who said, as your punishment for giving me the fruit, I am going to make sure that your desire is after me. The man did not determine the punishment the maker did. It's not Eve who says to Adam, because you have eaten the fruit I gave you, the earth shall turn against you. No, God says it. It's not the man that says, you snake, because you, you deceived us. I shall uh, 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 step on your head with my heel and you shall bruise my heel. No, the man has no authority over the snake. It is God who pronounces that judgment. What the world has missed today, particularly where the relationship between men and women are concerned, is that it remains God's prerogative to correct his creatures. A woman must be grateful for the husband she gets. A man must be grateful for the wife he gets. Together, they must work to fulfill their purpose in this world. If anything goes wrong, it is not for the man to beat. It is not for the woman to uh, 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 beat. It is not for the man to poison the wife. It is not for the woman to poison the husband. It is for both of them to bring each other before God and say, Lord, we are your people. You brought us together. We have harmed each other. I have cheated. I have done this. I have done that. We've come before you for correction, for fixing for training, for development. What must happen to us because you are our maker? That is the biblical model. That is what we see here. When Eve is brought to Adam, we don't hear at any point, we don't hear at any point, Adam saying to God, may I make some changes? I like my women with a darker skin. I like my women with a bit longer hair. I like my women with bigger breasts. There are no additions that are being made here by Adam. Adam receives and is grateful. Now, let me tell you where the problem is going to be. <clears throat> Obviously, if you get yourself married without God's uh, presence, you are going to have a problem because you became your own God. That is why now you want to edit your husband. That is why now you want to edit your wife. Because if your wife is a gift from the Lord, then I assure you, editing her doesn't bother you taking her to her maker in prayer, taking her to her maker through the study of the maker's word is what you do because she's a gift. And as a gift, you must speak to the manufacturer, the giver. Lord, I don't feel respected by my wife. Lord, I don't feel loved by my husband. Let's go into the word. What does the word say about love? What does the word say about respect? We are asking the maker. We are asking the maker to correct us, to develop us. Because we are 
bought each other's gifts from somebody else. I am a gift to my wife from the Lord. She is my gift from the Lord. And so the gifts cannot be creators on each other. The gifts must consult the manufacturer. The world is full of marriages that are run by correction, precisely because God was not consulted. See, your wife is a gift. If you treat your wife as a gift, the day you meet her, you are happy. Thank you, Lord. You have given me my helper, my core dominator. Are we together? Then your wife gets pregnant. Are you with me? Your wife gets pregnant and she gains weight. Follow me very carefully. Your wife gets pregnant and she gains weight. Yeah? She's a bit bigger than what she used to be. Yeah? You don't run and look for a thinner girl. Why? Why do you not run? Do you remember what is your purpose? To be fruitful and multiply? So she gained weight in the process of achieving purpose, isn't it? Isn't that part of the gift? So why now are you dissatisfied? Why now are you looking for a thinner girl? Did she not gain her weight as part of fulfilling the purpose? Is it not what the Bible said that the two of you must be fruitful and multiply? So now what's the problem? What's the problem? It's the gift. And the gift has performed as expected. The gift gets pregnant. God is good. The gift gained weight. It is a sign. It is functioning properly. The gift has given birth. That is exactly what it was supposed to do. That is what the gift must do. That is the purpose. Now, why are we dissatisfied? Why are we looking for thinner girls? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Because what remains is for us to say, wife, we have now fulfilled this purpose of bringing children into this world. We have done the first part where you've been pregnant and I've been taking care of you. Part two, we must now raise the child, okay? And as part of part two, let's talk about it. Would you like to go back to your previous weight? Yes, how can I help? Are we gymming together? Are we jogging together? Are we going on diet together? Because this was done in our dominion. It was in the name of being fruitful and multiplying that you gained this weight. And so together, still as part of team dominion, we have to work on your weight together. Not run and look for a thinner one. That's not the process of fulfilling purpose. This is something that many people don't get. People get injured going to work, car accidents. Yeah? Now a man is on a wheelchair. There was a car accident in the morning while he was going to work. Now the wife wants another man. He's in a wheelchair. What am I going to do? There is no sex in this marriage anymore. It is sexless. What is wrong? What, what, I, what, what is wrong with that thinking? Is he not injured as part of Pepos? Was he not part of the purpose of going in and out for the family to establish dominion? He was injured in the process of establishing dominion. You don't get to change 
You don't get to look for the one that walks. This is part of purpose. This is part of coming together for dominion. It's injuries in purpose, just like there are injuries on duty. It's injuries in purpose. We go back to the maker. We find out what's the next step. How do we go forward from here? Because there's been a injury on purpose. Someone has gained weight. Someone is on a wheelchair. Someone has lost a job. All those are injuries in purpose. And to, to then abandon your, your spouse because of an injury in purpose is proof one had no clue what they were doing when they came into the marriage institution. No clue. So we need to help people who want to get married to get their, their, their story straight and know exactly what they are going into. Know exactly what you are going into. Because this is not the bold and the beautiful. This is divine appointment for achieving a God-set plan. Yes, marriage is extremely fun. There are lots of fun things that happen in marriage. Marriage is not about uh, bills and uh, uh, work. No, there are extremely quite a lot of good things that happen within marriage, and they are also part of the purpose. But we need to sort out our foundational theologies because if we don't sort them out, we are going to continue to run marriages based on culture, based on earthly philosophies, but not really anchoring them on where God stands. Okay, so we're going to uh, pause there for today and then tomorrow we are going to continue again as we deal with these foundational issues. And we will still be in chapter two and then we'll also get into chapter three uh, dealing with the foundational issues of how marriage, uh, uh, marriages and relationships should be started, what they stand for, what is God's intention for them, and what the participants need to prepare and gear themselves up for as part of being in a relationship and ultimately later on being in a marriage. May God bless you and may God keep you. And I trust once again that uh, the lesson we've shared for today has helped to enlighten and lighten the load uh, of our marriage and our love lives. And I pray that we then take these discussions and we use them as, as, as a basis for further detailed discussions um, within our relationships and within our marriages. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful once again for this day, for what you've allowed us to achieve, for the energy you gave us and the breath that was in our lungs that allowed us to come in and go out in your name. I pray, Heavenly Father, that in all that we did, we did not shame you. But if we did, have mercy on us. Forgive us, O oh great and awesome God. Show us mercy, we plead in the name of Jesus and grant us another opportunity to live and live well. This evening, we pray again for our relationships, our marriages and our dating relationships. Our Father, we pray, reveal yourself and your purpose that our unions may not bring an embarrassment to the love that you have given, but may be a beacon of hope in a world that is full of hate. This we pray through Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Praise the Amen. Lord. Praise Amen. the Lord. Yeah. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Pastor, for this uh, powerful message. If you don't want to mess it up. Uh, let us all go and meditate about these words. May God bless everyone. Have a blessed night. Amen. 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 Amen.
Have a good night, all. Um,